this presentation is partly to do with MBI and partly to do with an update in uh, papillomas. Uh, in my practice, I, I see this uh, most weeks, unfortunately. Um, it's, uh, it's a it can be a very difficult problem. There are, we all have you know, our, our um, sort of <coughs> patients that at your heart, they walk in the door and your heart sinks. Um, there we've, there's a few of them around in our town and um, I've got my fair share. Sometimes they come from other ENT specialists. Sometimes they just come in the door. So I thought we'll have a quick look at respiratory papillomatosis. What are some of the treatment protocols we use at the moment, how they're changing and what some of the newer treatments are as well as with the role of NBI. There is definitely a role for NBI uh, use in papilloma uh, surveillance and treatment. So as you all know, human papilloma virus, it's a member of the papillomavirus family. The ones that cause the uh, benign lesions, type six and type 11, um, and if you type your patients, most of them are type six, thankfully. Um, the more malignant ones we see in uh, uh, the HPV-related oropharyngeal and tongue base uh, malignancies, um, and sometimes some intermediate types. So, you know, this is the typical uh, laryngeal appearance um, in the clinic, and some, this patient has had a number of previous procedures with various uh, specialists along the along the way, and you know, actually has a voice still, despite all the scar tissue that's formed there. Um, so that sometimes is what you see. There are a huge variation in the number of treatments that people have used for papilloma, and I think that reflects how difficult it can be to treat. Um, cold steel, still a reasonable thing to use. Microdebrider or coblation, I think that's good if there's bulky disease. Uh, laser and different types of laser have been, have been used. Um, my preference these days is for the KTP. Um, or maybe the blue light laser, but not the others. Um, and there are a whole host of adjuvant treatments which uh, may or may not work for particular patients. And people have tried all sorts of things. Um, you know, the, uh, people get their patients to buy spinach capsules off the internet. Maybe it helps, I don't know. So this is an older video of using the micro uh, which is useful, I think, for bulky disease. But the problem with it on the vocal fold particularly, is that I don't want to damage the superficial lamina propria for a benign condition because I can make them worse. I can give them a worse voice than they would have had with the papilloma. Um, the microdebrider can bleed. I, will, I normally will put some neuropathy soaked in adrenaline on there before I start while I'm setting up. Um, so I, I take a photo with the endoscope, put the neuropathies in, bring the microscope in, and by that stage normally it's um, less vascular. Um, but this is a highly vascular lesion. Um, it's a bit annoying when it bleeds. Um, and that part there, removing that part, is actually the bit that helps the patient's voice the most. The bulky it is at the anterior commissure level, the worse the voice. So this is sort of what's involved. Um, being, trying to be as precise as possible without damaging the underlying superficial lamina propria. The further away it is from the vocal fold itself, the more aggressive you can be with these, this or with a coblator. Um, I tend not to use coblator much anymore uh, for this. I, I went through a phase. Um, if it's really bulky, I'll use a microdebrider. And uh, let's sort of move towards the end of the thing. So that's sort of what I, I left the patient with. I left a very fine film of papilloma behind. It was obvious, but they got a good voice for a while. And the problem is it will uh, definitely grow in this patient unless something happens to their immune system and that changes. These days I would do that quite differently. I would do, I would, if it was that bulky, I might use the microdebrider. But then with that, I'd be quite happy to um, laser that with a KTP laser and they'll get an excellent voice outcome. And it won't come back anywhere near as quickly. There's also something else that I do now which sometimes helps as well. So office-based treatment in the States has been around for a long time. Um, back in 2003, Greg Postma published a paper on that using the pulse dye laser. I don't think they're around that much anymore because the, uh, the um, wavelength of the KTP is a little bit better. And so Zytel's group really published a whole lot of papers on that using it in office. There's a number of reasons why people do it in the office. In the States, it has a lot to do with uh, money and the health funds. Um, for some patients, it's a good idea, but you have to pick your patients. Um, 
and uh, in the States they save money. Um, we do as well here. The problem with um, doing it in the clinic is that it's not funded by the health funds or by Medicare. Um, so it actually ends up costing us or costing us money if it's in private. In public, it actually is better for the hospital overall. Um, but you have to pick the patient that you do it on. Um, this particular patient has a very small papilloma, or fairly small, tolerated it relatively well. Very anxious guy. He actually got a, his, the biggest problem with his, his procedure was that he got a, a really bad headache afterwards. Um, had nothing, he, I think he just tightened up, stiffened up. But I was able to um, uh, blanch the lesion. With, in office, you don't normally remove the entire lesion. You just blanch it, and that's enough for it to disappear over time. It sort of sloughs away over the next week or two. I have a patient who comes in every three, four months uh, to have it done under local. He doesn't want any sedation, he goes back to work. And he just has little spots. And he, he prefers to come in and have little spots, sort of spot welded, if you like, rather than wait a longer period and have a general anaesthetic. For him, that works, but it's not for everyone. Um, this is a, a similar case. So I, I call this like a laryngeal gargle. Um, I use a channeled uh, Olympus scope, the VT2 scope, drizzle local anaesthetic. And if you get the local anaesthetic right, you can do just about anything to the larynx. Um, I've taken out T1 cancers twice. That's not routine, by the way, but it, it, you can do it. Um, so a little uh, lesion like this, quite manageable. Um, not as accurate as under general anaesthesia, but the KTP laser is very forgiving because as long as you don't hit the same spot too many times and the settings are low, you, uh, the, you won't damage the superficial lamina propria. So that's um, another spot here. Um, and then under uh, general anaesthesia, uh, this time using a, um, a subglottic jet ventilation device. We all have patients with terrible airways. This was an immunocompromised renal transplant patient, probably my worst patient, I would say. Um, you know, I spent an hour and I used the flexible uh, channeled Olympus scope on two occasions to ablate all of these as much as I could, because he kept getting pneum recurrent pneumonias, um, partly because of immunocompromised, partly obstructive lesions. Um, and he has, he did okay for a while, but um, this is a terrible disease and it spread into his lungs and um, he passed away. Um, so, I mean, in this situation, I do use NBI, I turn it on. I mean, that one, you know, there's a lot of disease there. Um, you can sort of, pick where you want to um, ablate, um, but you can spend an hour, actually this patient we had to do it in two separate settings because by the end of the hour, the first hour, with jet ventilation he was quite a large gentleman, um, his oxygen saturations dropped where we couldn't elevate them enough so we had to come back in two weeks and, and complete the procedure. Um, it does look a bit, I'll sped this up obviously, it does look a bit different with NBI on. You get like an orange view to the green thing, green um, Hunsucker, but you get used to it and um, I'll routinely turn it on now. Uh, that was after the first case and we had to come back and, and do more later. Um, so narrow band imaging, um, we've dis discussed the technique and, and the uh, physiology behind it. Um, I don't use staining, um, you know, it's time consuming, it doesn't add that much for papillomas, uh, but for, um, but just pressing a button, that's really easy. Um, this is a patient from my clinic who was seeing me for her voice, she's a quite accomplished karaoke singer. Um, there's competitions for karaoke and she had a competition coming up and was in this sort of situation and was really, really struggling. Um, so I, I was really focused on her vocal folds, that's why she came to see me. Um, but I thought, oh, well, let's just turn NBI on. You know, th that was clearly just a, a benign sort of polyp. But then I thought, wow, look at that. So we'll just go back to that in a second. So on, her, on the right of screen, or here, you can probably appreciate that there's a little um, unusual lesion. 
Um, again, it doesn't look that worrying, and you will pick these things up from time to time. Um, but she went to theatre to have the vocal fold treated, and I um, removed this lesion at the same time. And it was just a benign um, papilloma. But you will, from time to time, if you turn NBI on, you'll find extra lesions. Uh, this is the system in my office. Uh, I have no shares in Olympus, unfortunately. Um, so I'm not sure why it's taking so long. So I th this one here, this was quite neat because I, you know, I thought I was pretty good at looking at the larynx with white light. And this patient had recurrent papillomas. And if you look closely, if we get close enough, that's the other key to examining, is getting close. So you can see a little lesion there. So we treated that under local anesthetic. And then maybe you can see a little spot here on the right uh, false fold, um, which I treat. Um, and I'll speed it up a little bit. And then I turned NBI on. And I was like, oh, no, there's another spot there, which I missed initially. And then I went really close, and I saw all these other areas. That one there, uh, thankfully not in the subglottis. But you'll see there's, there's a lot more papilloma than you can detect with white light with NBI. Uh, if you look at, um, so I, I'll just let the video play, but there, there were more lesions on the arytenoids and in the interarytenoid area of very, very early papilloma, which didn't show up with white light. Um, and I think sometimes that's why there's more recurrence, because we're, there's very early papilloma that you don't see. Um, and in fact, I'm pretty sure there was more in the interretinoid area that worried me. Um, so I spent a lot, I thought there were one or two lesions initially with white light, and it turned out to be five or six. And so the key lessons for me were turning NBI on and getting as close as possible. Uh, now maybe if I'd done it in an operating room under general anaesthesia, it would have been um, uh, easier for me to, to treat and manage. Um, and he also had, had something on the soft palate area, quite bulky. Um, and NBI, I think, helps determine your margins better for papilloma work. So I'd, I will routinely turn it on now, um, just for, for benign things like papillomas, because I think it adds a little bit. Um, Cytophavir, it's, as you know, it's a cytosine nucleotide analog. Uh, it's used for CMV retinitis, that's its approval. Um, Off-label use in the larynx, and it really doesn't have great evidence backing it up. Um, there's one double-blind placebo-controlled randomised control that looked at it. Um, they changed the dose halfway through the trial, and they found that it had no benefit. There are retrospective studies. Um, I think Fred Dicker's group probably have the most data on this, and uh, they've also done an email review of all the members of the European Laryngology Society. Generally, people are positive. Um, my personal experience, I, I don't use it at all. I don't, I'm not convinced it has really a role at all. Um, I don't know. And, and possibly has side effects. You know, you can, um, as Professor Pretty was saying to me yesterday when we were chatting about this, the cytophavir itself can cause scarring, and then you end up with a worse voice than if you hadn't injected cytophavir. So I'm not a big believer in it, I don't use it. Something I am starting to use though, and I have used probably for the last 18 months now, is injecting bevacizumab or Avastin into the vocal fold. And uh, the first, so this is again Zytel's group from Boston, he's um, been using it for a number of years. Um, so I th the, the cases that I tried it in initially were the worst ones where you've got disease in the anterior commissure. And um, you know, if you laser the whole lot, you can end up with a web and the voice is terrible forever. So my treatment is to laser one side with a KTP, maybe come back and do the rest another time or just be as gentle as I can. So I had four patients. I uh, lasered one side and I injected the other side. The first two, when they came back for follow-up, the side that I injected, it had completely disappeared. There was nothing. Um, so that was two out of two, and I was like, this is going to revolutionise and put me out of a job. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't, because the next two patients I did, it made no difference. And I've used it um, for my patients that have recalcitrant or recurrent disease that need to go to theatre a few times a year. And I think, you know, I've had probably six patients now. I think it's about 50-50 in terms of who it helps and who it doesn't. 
but it is something that I think we should be offering our patients. I use the same formulation as the eye uh, ophthalmologists inject into the eye um, because it's easier and, and cheaper to, to access. Um, so there, there are some guidelines for it. I, I guess you um, tell the patient that this is off-label use and that it is, um, there are, is some evidence for it, but it's mostly out of one centre. Um, there haven't been any randomised trials on its use. So there are case reports of people using it for systemic, uh, systemic disease, um, particularly or using it systemically, so intravenous uh, EGFR uh, medications for patients particularly with progressive uh, pulmonary papillomas. And there are some case reports um, in paediatrics where it has been useful. It does have side effects. And particularly in immunosuppressed people, it can be um, toxic. So you have to be careful. But if you have nothing to lose in a dying patient, perhaps, it's something that I would, I would consider. The other thing that has really changed the nature of um, this disease in Australia and the rest of the world is the Gardasil vaccine, uh, which is uh, on the, um, the vaccine schedule for females and males now, uh, certainly available since I think about 2009, um, seven, seven. 2007. Um, Dan Novakovic in Sydney ran a trial looking at all, all over Australia, a wide, Australia wide trial of paediatric or juvenile respiratory papillomatosis and the incidence of papillomatosis in Australia since the introduction of the vaccine has dropped significantly every year since the introduction. I think it started at 0.16 per 100,000, so very rare. It's now 0.02 per 100,000, or it was in 2015. So that's um, the first trial, I think, or first study in the world that showed that the vaccine has made a big difference for respiratory papillomatosis. The vaccine, there is some evidence um, that giving the vaccine to patients who actually have the disease, even after they have it, it may uh, modulate the immune response and it may actually have some benefit. Um, I don't really understand why, but uh, that's sort of a, an anecdotal thing. And certainly the European guidelines now suggest that you should offer it to those patients. Um, I guess they don't have much to lose. And if patients keep coming back, they'll try anything. You know, the, the people were trying the mumps uh, vaccine at one stage. Again, there was only one paper that maybe had some benefit on that. So I think the future is prevention. That's what's going to um, help the most. Avastin may help for some people. Um, the Celebrex trial, I think, has actually been ceased um, because the results were not good. Um, same with propanolol. Um, and then uh, and maybe in, in the future, genetic typing may, may help some people. So it's a potentially aggressive disease, particularly type 11, uh, where it can spread more into the subglottis and the airways. I think you should treat, the studies have shown you should treat reflux and asthma. Both of those things can make the outcome worse. Um, KTP laser is really nice to use, uh, especially on the vocal folds. You can, you can remove a lot more than you would otherwise. Intralesional things, I don't use Sotofovir, but Avastin I do sometimes. And there's a new nine-valent vaccine which has come out. Uh, it's available now in Australia. I'm not sure if it's on the schedule, but it's certainly available. Um, and NBI, you know, both in your clinic and in the operating room, will allow you to see more disease and give your patients a better outcome. Um, you know, if I was going to give a number, I'd say probably 20% better, 20-25% uh, better um, assessment with NBI for papillomas. Thank you. Any questions? Michael. Um, certainly, I mean, my teaching, which is antiquated, uh, or my, my teachers, uh, traditionally we were uh, looking for um, preserving voice and airway with uh, treatment of RRP. So my dogma is you don't take every papilloma away. Seems like you're treating absolutely everything. And my concern with that is you, you develop metaplasia and if ever the papillomas, now that may be my simplistic uh, view on it uh, because you're not getting laser misfire. It's a much more accurate um, uh, treatment. What, what are your view, what's your view on that? Because you know, my, my thoughts is there's a happy medium between how much you treat and how much you leave behind. Yeah. 
you seem to be going for everything. Uh, it depends on the patient. Um, so if a patient's in the operating room, I'll treat anything that I can comfortably treat, not causing any damage to the vocal fold or scar tissue in the airway. Um, and with the KTP, I'm very comfortable uh, looking at the wound healing results that it, it doesn't, if you're gentle, you don't have to ablate the lesion. You can just uh, blanch it and it will go away. Um, I did in that um, immunocompromised patient um, because I didn't want him to come back to theatre anytime soon. In my experience with my fellow that you know of is that he went away into state, had laser and came back with terrible tracheal disease. Now whether that was going to happen or not, it may well have been, I don't know. But I think he's in his dilemma because of of over treating. Did they use a CO2? Piece? Yes. Yeah, I, I think the CO2 is blind. And blind forceps. So that was, you know, 15 yeah. years ago. So, yeah, trauma to the airway, I think any trauma to the airway, which is probably why reflux contributes to recurrence, any trauma, um, surgical trauma, uh, is a site where papilloma can, um, can uh, regenerate. Um, so, keeping the mucosa as intact as possible uh, is something that we we um, teach all the registrars, all the trainees, um, don't cause any trauma to any other tissue other than the papilloma itself. Mm. So you'll be pretty much treating everything you can see under MBI, you'll be treating with KTP? Correct, yeah. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't use the CO2 at all for, um, for papilloma. It's a very good tool, cut, very good cutting tool for um, malignancy, but I don't. I, I think for papilloma, KTP is much better, much gentler. Um, yeah, I mean it is a balance. What do you think, Dr. Pretty? Yeah, yes, but theoretically, the KTP has a deeper penetration in terms of dermal derma damage compared to CO2. So uh, probably you you feel more comfortable because uh, you can use uh, with the fiber. Uh, but uh, I don't know, I have no idea. I, I, I talk in theoretically. But uh, if you look the the physics of the laser, the KTP is a 432 nanometer wavelength. So it's a deeper absor absorption compared to, to CO2. So theoretically, it causes more fibrosis uh, compared to the CO2. But uh, just uh, talking about the physical principle of the laser. I think it depends on the settings. So with a CO2, if you actually have um, a higher power, that often will have less uh, depth of penetration. With a KTP, I turn it right down mm -hmm. um, and stay further away from the tissue. Uh, and um, I'm, I haven't done histological studies, but if you're just blanching the vessels and the lesion, it's not the same as, yeah, it's a different, it's, so you don't have to resect the whole thing. For resection, I agree, KTP is not, is not a good a tool. Correct, yeah. One other question, when you used Nesifuzumab, um, did you inject and then KTP treat, or you picked your lesions and thought, well, I'll just treat these with Nesifuzumab, see how, we, how they respond, or the Avastin, and then? I just, I, I lasered, one side and the other side I injected and I didn't laser it. Now I um, tend to do both. I'll put a little uh, bit of, bit of sismab in the superficial lamina propria. Don't put it in the muscle. If you accidentally get it in the muscle, there's one case report of atrophy of the thyroid node muscle. So um, yeah, don't put it in there. But uh, So these days, depending on how extensive the disease is, I'll try and inject the lesion itself, but very superficially. Yeah, I, I think there are some patients that respond very well. Mm. Uh, which kind of concentration do you use anastin? Uh, I think it's 20, <coughs> 25 milligrams per mil. Okay. Uh, I'll double, I have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure it's, Is that what you're using, Michael? Whatever comes up from pharmacy. Doctor. Yeah, 25. <laughs> it's, I, the, it's the commercial preparation. That yeah. Is it already it's already prepared. Okay. Yeah. You, No. Mm. All right. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, we'll break for morning tea and then we'll look forward to Professor Farah afterwards. Thank you.